Right, good afternoon. To brass historians, Joseph Mayfrey's greatest significance lies in the groundbreaking method which he wrote for the valve horn in 1840. So, oops, it's not working. Oh, now we've gone to past two. All oh, right. How do we go back? We've got to point to the computer, have I? Right, okay. I'll start again. To brass historians, uh, Joseph Mayfrey's greatest significance lies in the groundbreaking method which he wrote for the valve horn in 1840, though to his friend Jules Lovey, he was first and foremost a long-standing performer with the orchestra at the Paris Opera. And though by describing him as a member of the literature section, he was hinting that there was so much more to him than that. So, following Lovey's lead, the intention of this presentation is to venture beyond the way in which Mayfair is perceived today, as the author of a fascinating and much-discussed method, to delve into some of the other areas of his career, set them against the background of Parisian life, and illuminate Mayfrey the man. Despite their Germanic-looking names, name, Mayfrays had lived in Castellan in Upper Provence since as far back as the 16th century. By the 18th century, a court was based in the town, and among the lawyers there was a, J a Joseph Mayfrey, one of whose sons became a judge, while another, André, worked for the, the French military customs service. By the time André's son, Joseph Pierre, the focus of this talk, was born on the 13th of November, 1791, he held the rank of lieutenant and was principal customs officer in the pretty walled village of Colmar, 30 miles north of Castellan. André died before Joseph was nine, but he was most likely the Mayfrey who in 1794 wrote to the Public Safety Committee, the body which asserted almost total power during the French Revolution, congratulating them on their work. If so, and judging by his effusive style, it's easy to see where Joseph got his love of writing from. In 1800, young Joseph was accepted into the government-funded Pritaneum, a school for the sons of deceased officers. This was in Compiègne, 900 kilometres north of his home, and was a place where everything was done by beat of drum and strict military discipline. The boys marched, in order, from their beds to their schoolrooms, to their meals, to their play, and back to their bedrooms. How the little boy coped is unrecorded, though it was there that he first showed his musical talents. He was attracted to a painting of a horn above the door of the school's music room, and when he started to learn, he made such progress that, aged only 12, he gave a concert in Compiègne's theatre. During Mayfrey's time there, Napoleon visited the school, and having previously complained that French industry lacked tradesmen able to make a plan or perform the simplest calculation or express his ideas in a sketch or statement, he decided to modify the Pritaneum's curriculum to help correct this, shortage skill, this skill shortage and then decreed that the students should be transferred to a new arts and crafts school in chalon sur marne There... The students had to study grammar, mathematics and drawing, as well as metalwork, foundry work, carpentry, lathe work and wagon making. Mayfrey came top in most subjects, and when he left in 1812, he was immediately appointed to the director, the director, as assistant to the director of its workshop. While this developed skills which Mayfrey would use in designing instruments, the school's founder, the Duke of La rochefoucauld liancourt saw that he was not cut out for a career in industry, and his wife, who was a maid of, maid of honour to the Empress Josephine, arranged for Mayfrey to become a secretary at the Empress's home. Josephine was passionate about art, sculpture, garden design and music. Mayfrey's duties were light, and he clearly loved life there, not least because the horn player, Frédéric Duvenois, was a frequent visitor. Duvenois was said to be the performer whom all horn players sought to imitate, and Mayfrey was no exception. While Duvenois' playing made his mind up about his future, events were taking place elsewhere which would shape world history and Mayfrey's destiny too. Napoleon's forces had marched on Russia in 1812, but when they were beaten back, the Allies went on the offensive and took control of Paris in, 18, in March 1814. Napoleon was forced into exile, and Louis XVIII took the throne. Mayfrey returned to Provence, probably to Castellan, where a young woman called Catherine Meij lived. Nothing more is known about her, except that in 1815 she gave birth to a girl, Marie Josephine, 
have we lost the we've lost the picture right he gave birth to a, a girl marie josephine and that mayfrey was the baby's father um, we'll uh, meet her again later in june 1814 louis created a new chamber of peers among them was La Rochefoucauld-Liancourt, who appointed Mayfrey as his secretary. Though while it was work, it wasn't what Mayfrey wanted to do. Meanwhile, Louis was proving unpopular with his subjects. Napoleon slipped away from Elba, raised an army, marched on Paris, and entered the city in March 1815. Louis fled to Ghent, the Duke retreated to his country estates, and the course was now clear for Mayfrey to become a professional musician. Normally, auditions at the Paris Conservatoire were held in front of five inspectors, but for Mayfrey there were just two, Luigi Cherubini and Etienne Mehul. Their very brief notes have survived. Cherubini jotting down, went well, while Mehul wrote, hmm, he has facility, admitted. And so, on the 12th of December, 1815, Mayfrey joined his hero Duvenois class, or nearly. The Allied forces had become determined to defeat Napoleon for once and for all. Napoleon took the fight to the enemy and marched on the British and Prussian armies, but was defeated at Waterloo in June. He was exiled to St Helena, and, with the return of the monarchy in July, there was a purge targeting civil servants perceived to have supported Napoleon. So, a fortnight after Mayfair had been ad admitted, the Conservatoire was forced to shut, and when it reopened, Duvenois had retired. Mayfrey joined the class of his successor, Louis-Francois Dopra, but did not find it easy. Cherubini noted that while he was doing well enough, he will not make any further progress. He was still sceptical in 1817. It's going very well, but it's a pity he salivates too much. It alters the quality of his sound. Though by April 1818, he seemed more kindly disposed towards him. Going well, also he is strong. And that year, with François Jacquemin, Mayfrey shared the Conservatoire's first prize. On leaving, he was appointed corps bass at the Théâtre Italienne, but when Pierre-Louis Collin died in 1822, Mayfrey replaced him in both the Royal Chapel and at the Opera, holding the latter post until 1850. Occasionally, he featured as a soloist, but developments in instrument design focus his attention elsewhere. Mayfrey was the first in Paris to see the potential of was among the first in Paris to see the potential of valves. From 1826, he worked with Jacques Charles Labaye on an instrument which they entered in an exposition held in the Louvre in August 1827. But theirs was not the only valve horn on show. Jean Louis Antoine, better known as Hallery, had also built one. Mayfrey wanted his horn to retain the use of crooks, but in order to facilitate this, he needed a way of altering the length of the valves, a problem he solved by adding tuning slides to them. The jury preferred Mayfrey's horn, awarding it a silver medal, while Hallery received a bronze. Although Hallery had been in competition with Mayfrey, they joined forces. Lebay dropped out of the picture, and on the 6th of May, 1833, Le Figaro reported on a performance of a brass quintet by Ye uh, Georg Jakob Struntz. The player's instruments were made by Hallery and were designed by Mayfrey, and the very same edition of the paper announced that Mayfrey had just been made the Conservatoire's first valve horn professor. Mayfrey, Mayfrey taught there alongside Dopra and then Gallet, the handhorn professors, though there was no crossover at all between the membership of their classes. Valves allowed a greater range of notes in the horn's lower register, so the main purposes of his class were to produce low horn specialists for Parisian orchestras and to train military bandsmen. The opening of the Gymnase Musical Militaire in 1836, a school devoted to training young military musicians, might easily have led to the class's closure. Mayfrey advised on its foundation and was favourite to be appointed its director, but instead the job went to the clarinetist Friedrich Baer. After Baer's death in 1838, Mayfrey again expressed an interest, but this time the job went to Michaela Carafa. Mayfrey was obviously a supportive teacher, but one who ins insisted on hard work. In 1842, he described Alexander Cuneau as the most studious member of the class, owing more to work than to natural talent. Yet writing about François-Louis Carteret from the same class, he pulled no punches. Since the last exam, he has forgotten rather than learned. 
He is very careless, and although he won second prize, I must ask that the decision over whether he competes in the next Concours be deferred until later. Carteret took Mayfrey's comments to heart, and the following year he won first prize. One can see Mayfrey becoming increasingly direct in his comments on uh, Hallery's son, Jules. He started out in quite good humour, writing that he was starting to recover from the malaise of laziness, which I thought incurable. And a year later, he was still trying to be positive. He is essentially lazy, but he's made great strides. Patience was running thin by June 1844. He is indolent and lazy by nature, but I, I am satisfied with his work, and he has made much progress. But by December, he clearly lost it with him, writing just two words, very lazy. Hallery finally got the message and won the prize, and won first prize in 1845. He and Mayfrey became friends and colleagues, and Mayfrey wrote a long and amusing poem for his wedding. Wider events would again play their part in Mayfrey's career. Mayfrey, uh, Paris was usually peaceful, if politically tense, though there were periodic riots, and in 1830 these led to the abdication of Charles X, which in turn led to the abolition of the orchestra of the Royal Chapel and the end of Mayfrey's position there. Charles's cousin Louis-Philippe became king, and it was at first far more popular. One way in which uh, he maintained order was through Paris's National Guard. Membership was initially open to those wealthy enough to pay taxes or vote, so more likely to favour the royalist cause, though from 1837 it was open to shopkeepers and small-scale merchants. It was divided into 12 legions, each with a band, and in around 1837, Mayfrey joined the band of the Third Legion, eventually becoming its conductor. Although they were mostly amateur, the bands were highly regarded and often included professionals from the highest echelons of Parisian music making, and Mayfrey continued to conduct his band for the rest of his life. Poor harvests in the 1840s led to tough economic conditions across Europe, and in Paris, matters came to a head in February 1848. Many of the National Guard, particularly those from the merchant classes, now sided with the anti-royalist rebels, and Louis-Philippe was forced to flee. A general election was called for the 23rd of April, and on the 22nd, so 175 years ago tomorrow, Citizen Mayfrey signed a letter to the press explaining that a huge association of Parisian artists playing brass instruments had been formed to march at the head of major events and to allow p people to participate in the sweet and noble emotions that music provides. It also explained that 400 musicians had already performed patriotic airs to Louis Blanc, one of the leading socialist thinkers of the day. They then participated in the Fête Républicaine des Corporations on the 14th of May, alongside a vast choir of Orphéonistes. Orphéons were male voice choirs formed to promote music among the workers, and as such had similar aims to Mayfrey's play planned bands. While no more was heard of the bands, the Orphéons continued to flourish. They became immensely popular, and during the 1850s, they joined together with amateur brass and wind bands to form the Orphéon et Société Instrumentale. Mayfrey became president of the brass and wind band sections and frequently adjudicated their competitions. After the revolution, Louis Napoleon was elected president of France. Adolf Sachs got his attention, and when Louis Napoleon declared himself emperor, Sachs lost no time in inviting him to visit his workshop. In 1854, he persuaded Napoleon to decree that military bands should be reorganised to include Sachs instruments, which also meant that bands would no longer include horns. Although not all bands fell into line, a large part of the purpose of Mayfrey's class to train military bandsmen had been removed. Worse was to come. In 1856, the new government closed the Gymnase Musical Militaire and the Conservatoire was forced to take in new army musicians. But as the horn was no longer a military instrument, the appearance of the new students did nothing to boost Mayfrey's number. And indeed, in 1858, four of his students left him to study in Jean-Baptiste Arban's saxhorn class. As a performer on the valve horn, 
Mayfrey made a spectacular debut in 1828 as featured soloist in the Société des Concerts du Conservatoire's first ever concert, but he, he then settled into his role as fourth horn of the opera, playing at every major premiere there from Auber's La Mouette de Portici in 1828 to Meyerbeer's Le Prophète in 1849. The first composer to write operatic valve horn parts was Alavi who incorporated two in his score of La Juive. And at the first performance in 1835, the parts were played by Mayfrey and by Frédéric Duvenois' nephew, Antoine Frédéric Duvenois. Though it didn't start a trend, the next major premiere there was Les Huguenots. And at the time, Meyerbeer was still unconvinced by the need for vowels and continued to write horn parts in the traditional way. In April 1834, Mayfrey's daughter Josephine, remember her, married clockmaker and amateur horn player Arsène Deshaies. And in August, Mayfrey and his new son-in-law took out a, pa a patent for a valve which involved a series of valvules, little flaps which opened additional tubing, though it's doubtful that they were ever made. Mayfrey experimented with other types of valves too, and the first edition of his uh, horn method shows a two-valve instrument by Hallery Senior with an unknown valve design. By the time of its second edition, his recommended model had Perinet-style style valves, but with an ascending third valve designed by his very lazy student, Jules Hallery. Mayfrey was also an efficient administrator. He was secretary of the Société des Conseils du Conservatoire for 20 years, and while much of the work was routine, he occasionally encountered problems which would leave most modern-day society officers screaming. He was forced to cancel the Conservatoire's opening concert of 1845 when the District, of, uh, District Commissioner of Police served notice forbidding it because he had neither sought their permission nor sent them the programme with the names of the pieces and performers or the approval and visa of the Minister of the Interior. Oh dear. He also served on the Committee of a Musician's Pension Fund, was president of an organisation for alumni for his school, and adjudicated regularly at the Conservatoire and elsewhere. He wrote for the Revue et Gazette Musicale, among other, music, uh, among other magazines, contributing articles at, uh, attacking attempts to replace contemporary church music with Gregorian chant, on popular music education in France, and further pieces on the development of vows. He was a published poet and read his verses as an after-dinner turn at banquets and wedding. He was also a photographer, and in 1855 he opened a gallery which displayed portraits of the staff at the Conservatoire and many of Paris's artists. His interest in the visual arts was also apparent from an article he wrote for an archery magazine describing a tableau showing the martyrdom of St. Sebastian. This had been displayed in the entrance to the Imperial Company of Archers shooting range in Paris, where Mayfrey held the rank of Chevalier. He was also apparently a good shot. Mayfrey retired on the 1st of October 1864, just days before Gallet died. Rather than appointing two new professors, the Conservatoire decided to discontinue Mayfrey's class, appointing Jean Moore to teach only the natural horn. Numbers had dwindled, and when Moore took over, just two students transferred to him from Mayfrey, and Moore's report on one of them read, This student has only been to my class once, and he didn't have his horn with him. <laughs> We've all been there. Uh, Numbers, numbers attending Gallet's class had been a little better, with around six or seven students, but this was still a relatively small number. While the Conservatoire's hierarchy might have been guilty of short-sightedness and complacency by closing Mayfrey's class, as a practical response to falling numbers and the suppression of horns in military bands, it must have seemed rational enough, and not just a manifestation of their conservatism, as is often suggested. Nonetheless... By the time he retired, valve horns were starting to gain real traction. Musard's orchestra had used them since the 1830s. Three members of the opera orchestra, Urbain, Duvenois and Hallery, were expert valve horn players, and the instrument was now the horn of choice for many of Paris's professionals. Mayfrey must have known that the valve horn genie was now out of the bottle and that there was nothing the Conservatoire could do to push it back. 
He maintained cordial relations with them during his retirement, however, and one of his last engagements in July 1867 was to adjudicate at the Concours for Horn. He died a month later at 6.30 a.m. on the 28th of August after a fall on the stairs at his home. His band from the Garde Nationale performed at his fun funeral at L'Église de la Sainte Trinité and some of Paris's finest artists sang the mass. There is still so much more, but that's all we have time for today, so thank you for listening. <laughs>